everyone. Uh, welcome to S2S Conversations with Peter and Zia. And today we are so thrilled to have Rory Duff with us. Rory is a geobiologist who's written several books on the topic of the Earth energy lines, the ley lines, and including this one, which is probably going to appear backwards. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, a guide to ley lines, earth energies, nodes, and large vortexes. An amazing book. And, and also another one called Grail Found, which also I haven't had a chance to read that one yet, but it sounds very intriguing and interesting. Rory is one of the world's leading experts on, on ley lines right now. And you started out as a geologist. And so we'd love to hear how, how you made that uh, shift and transformation from geologist to geobiologist. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Sia, Peter, for inviting me on and, and for um, asking me to to share some of the information that that, that I've come across. Um, how, how did it start, start off, I guess? Well, um, one of the things that I like to ask people, what, 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 when you go back to what was the first decision you ever made in life? You know, what, if, you, if you can't perhaps remember that, what was the first thing that really excited you in life? And, and 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 for me, the very first decision I had was to choose whether to continue doing history or or, or to study the new subject of geology. So that that's always stuck in my mind that choice, and I really relished having chosen geology. It just ignited a passion within me. So you know, I finished uh, my my qualifications and degree in that, and uh, I found myself in Africa working in the mines as a structural geologist. Um. With several other geologists, one of them, an Italian chap, um, who Paolo, his name was, who, who who used to get rung up by by the local farmers, uh, and uh, they're looking for water. Thought the geologists would know, so he said, "Rory, come, we go, we go look for water today." You know, so okay, right? And he gets these two rods out the back of his car, and I'm thinking, "What are you doing?" He says, "Oh, we know the water's here, Rory. We just don't know exactly where." <laughs> So we proceeded to to Dowers and we found the channels. And in this particular case, it was limestone and, and uh, limestone erodes in very narrow channels. So you know, it can be you know, quite a lot of meters down, but the channels are about that wide. You can miss it with a drill easily. And so the accuracy was really important. And um, so we would we douse uh, and hit water. And, and the key learn there was, even though you got the rod movement, you didn't know you hit water until you drilled it. So there's an important feedback mechanism. And you always need to find ways of getting feedback. And we used to practice on the, on the, on the mine lawns, which had sprinkler systems. You never quite knew where the pipes would be heading towards the sprinklers. So you would, you would look to find the water in the pipes. And, and, and the, the good thing is you don't have to dig up the, the, the whole lawn. You can just put your rod down in and you'll feel the pipe. OK, so by by finding where you think the water pipe is, you then put that rod down in. And if it doesn't go very far, you get a click, 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 and you know that you've hit the, the pipe. So this was a, a wonderful introduction scientifically of testing. Uh, and we did quite a bit of water dowsing there. When, when I when I came back some years later, um, settled in Devon and, um, and that's the UK for people who are not, not, not familiar with that. Uh, uh, southwest of the UK, uh, I came across uh, Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst's book, The Sun and the Serpent, which is like uh, the, the, the starting point for so many people in, in uh, Earth energies and you know, the Earth energy work. And I thought, well, that's actually not far from me um, since I was living near Exeter. Um, I'll see if I can find it because I knew I could douse for water. So uh, after a short while, it, it was a place called Crediton. And the um, Holy Cross Church there. I found the Michael line fairly easily. It took me about three quarters of an hour to find the the Mary line. It didn't work out why for what some time, but uh, uh, yeah. So that intrigued me, and, it, and and I guess with science you need curiosity. So you just maybe think, well, what what on earth is causing this? You know, no one seemed to know. And at the time, I'd just taken my children to to my two sons to, to learn to do Aikido. And that began to interest me because it was all about working with key energy. 
and so I was thinking, okay, what's the key? What's this key energy, human key, and what's this earth chi? <laughs> so I was I was spellbound on that, and that introduced me to uh, science, uh, back to uh, quantum quantum energies and um, the, the the four main forces in the universe: the electromagnetic force, the gravitational force, the strong and weak force in the atoms. So I immersed myself into to that, thinking that it had a link to gravity. And I, I looked at uh, the fact that the energy lines would tend to to locate at the areas of relative high ground. In other words, high ground relative to the surroundings. That that it interested me, and I, I followed the, the Michael and Mary line where I could find it and, and try to learn about it. And then I started studying the um, the science of, of, of relativity. And I thought I, I a long time ago, about 1999, I wrote my first book about. Um, it was a novel combined with science, which didn't really work, but it helped me get my thoughts together. It also introduced me to uh, an amazing man, an absolute genius called Ron Pearson, who we both had boxer dogs. And we I just moved to a new job up and, and, and moved me relocated to, to North, and Wil North Wiltshire, which is around the corner from him. So for 15 years, we walked up boxer dogs on the weekends together and I helped him with getting his theories down on paper. I should mention that he was a university lecturer in thermodynamics and fluid mechanics. Uh, he was an inventor of a gas wave, wave turbine. He's, he's worked at DARPA, um, at, at a genius. And he retired at fairly early age and begun to see the ridiculousness of some of the physics that he came across, including the uh, the Big Bang Theory, which uh, at, at, his, in, at his moment in time, he was pointing out all the flaws in the Big Bang Theory. And now we've got the new James Webb telescope, which is which has come out. It's just blowing all of this Big Bang theory completely out of water with uh, galaxies and galaxy formations and superclusters in, in the universe, which are just way too old to possibly be allowable under the the finite term of thirteen point eight billion years for the Big Bang. So Ron was proved right about that. He also was, he was explaining where dark energy must have, must have come from. In the end, he. He wasn't accepted because this theory of his had the unfortunate side effect of explaining how intelligence must have arisen behind the universe. And, and that then went on and he showed how that led to a full theory of quantum gravity. And they didn't like that either because he didn't need to use relativity theory. So he was in a he was in a, a, a giant intellectual in amongst a field of people who were uncomfortable that he was unencumbered, an independent physicist and, and not... Uh, and not you know, having to rely upon tenure at some university, so they were they were distancing him wherever the way they could. But he was uh, he was promoted quite well from another, another chap I knew called Michael Roll, who was uh, and who would introduced him to survival after death. And of course, Ron's theories explained all about not just where the intelligence must have come at a subquantum level, but also uh, where the mind goes after death. I mean, we had a, suddenly we got a complete scientific basis for all of these things, like healing, the lot. Um, and it, it, it didn't need the ridiculousness of more than three dimensions. And, and people talk about four, five, six, seven, eight, nine dimensions, but it can be it can be really easily understood as different frequencies of matter. So if we have a range in which we can see from out of the whole spectrum and a range for, with which we can hear from out of the full spectrum. We have a range with which we can feel within a full spectrum and, and, and our mind tunes into this particular matter frequency world that we're in. And yet there are other matter frequency worlds that, that our mind can also tune in and other beings with other minds tune into all in the same area, but just on a different frequency. And so the ultimate of what what he he was talking about was that the the universal consciousness which was constantly creating the energy on the on the quantum level that made up the particles like the muons and, and, and the electrons i think all that all that is just a bundle of energy there's nothing solid in it but it's actually coming from the sub quantum level which is where the only real reality is which is where the universal consciousness organizes the waves and creates these particles of matter and then as as the waves back off and then come up again, you find you've got a, a, a particle which appears and disappears, appears and disappears. M much like um, what you find um, Seth 
describing uh, with his all the different camouflage systems in that great work by Jane Roberts, uh, Seth, Seth Speaks and the True Nature of Reality. He, he says that reality pops in and out at an extremely fast rate. So, well, Ron's theory is going to explain that. So we have at this stage vibration and universal intelligence at the heart of everything, creating everything. And Ron actually came across my work and he, he saw that I was linking chi energy to gravity and, and various other things. And you know, so the synchronicity there was leading me to, to meet Ron. And um, as, as you know, with synchronicity, there's a theme that if you start exploring it, you, 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 you find your path. You, you, in fact, life begins to conspire to take you where you're supposed to go. <laughs> w- warts and all. <laughs> it's not always good. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's, it's an interesting path. Um, so that that led me to to connecting these earth energy lines with uh, with vibrations, and I was looking for a reason why earth energy lines should be to do with vibrations, and and that's when it became fairly obvious that I had to start mapping the lines. So uh, I was working for ten years for one company, and they paid paid for my car and petrol, so I was. Uh, able to detour every day for six years on the way home. So for about an hour a day for six years, I would map energy lines across the north of Wiltshire. And and literally that was just, you know, if you want to know what's going on, you know, look and, and make observations and don't judge too soon. And uh, soon all sorts of things started popping out that the, the lines aren't the same. They have they have side to side movements, which have different frequencies. And and the easiest way was seeing that they had different widths. They, they, their, their movements had different characteristics as well. So I began to, to, to develop a, a sort of understanding of, of how we distinguish between lines. I was very fortunate to have a, a friend who was an ophthalmologist, a lovely skeptic, because you need skepticism here. Uh, and he and I would check each other's work. And that, that then uh, allowed us to pro- progress a bit faster. But as soon as you've got this side to side movement, you've got something to measure. And, and, and it, it's, it, it has a frequency, a very, very low frequency. But what you've got is these energy lines, even if they're at different levels, they would they would move from side to side. And if you, uh, even at this way, of side to side like that. Um, but four times a year, all of these frequencies suddenly moved exactly the same. They got to one end at the same time and the other end at the same time. And it lasted for about three quarters of a day. Back in 2007, when we, we discovered this, which was fascinating, why why was this going on? So we were just still filled with questions. And the upshot of it was the best hypothesis was that the inner core of the Earth, which is solid, iron and nickel, is behaving like a transducer, just as you find them in microphones. And, and the, a transducer takes one form of energy and converts it to another. So you've got the electromagnetic energy in the outer core converted into a spherical standing waves of vibration which essentially is like a like a loudspeaker pumping backwards and forwards, expanding and contracting in this core of the Earth, sending out spherical standing waves of vibrations all the way to the surface where you've got low, low and high pressure uh, co- concentrations or, uh, within a field. And, and these lines are essentially um, linear concentrations of, of uh, very low frequency vibrations, um, which begun to explain a few things like the, the significance of resonance and, and uh, the law of correspondence. When you started finding that uh, when you make a sound, you, you blow a, a, a horn or something that would play a guitar synthesis at a certain frequency, you hit a, a particular harmonic. It's about the 24th, 25th harmonic from the base fundamental frequency of, of the actual um, vibrations. Um, everything starts resonating. And, and the, the very few times we got it right, with a friend of mine who's a guitarist, we we, we tuned his guitar to the high harmonic and, and fiddled with it a bit, and then he added something like he calls an ebo, which sustains the note. When we get it right, which was the first time we were looking at each other in total disbelief because everything was shaking. Wow. There was this the, the, the Knights Templar had, a, had one of their greatest secrets is about called the infinite spiral of the fifths. Mm-hmm. which is the Pythagorean fifths where everything is vibrating in resonance. So this is the kind of, as soon as that happens, just like anything you wish for is going to come in, into, into being. It's that kind of powerful. You've, you've, you've connected, if you like, to source. So Roy, I'll just want to interrupt for a second. So, so you mentioned the four dates, and I assume those are the winter solstice, summer, and the equinoxes. Or, or close well, yeah, to... that's, what you'd, that's what you'd think. <laughs> but it wasn't the case to start with. 
it was a bit confusing because the harmony days to start with was always the day before the solstices and the equinoxes. And it took about three quarters of a year before we suddenly came across the word tekufa, which is an, uh, linked to the ancient Hebrew holy days, which was handed down by word of mouth. And the the, tr the right translation for tekufa is the last day of the cycle. And it was referring to the sun. And, and he, with a bit of mechanics, we started realizing that the last day of the cycle um, was the day before the solstice and the equinoxes, because the solstice and the equinoxes were the first day of the sun. And, and that was when the, the celebration day in the summer, it's at St. John's Feast, which was the celebration day. And of course, you'd always celebrate after the holy day. So the holy days were were always the tekufa. That, and we, we had our first group meditations on, on oh, we always start on the day before now. But then the, the weird stuff started happening in 2017. We, we had an influx of energy. Uh, the energy lines all widened. It went, suddenly became twice the width. I mean, I rang, I emailed a few people, said, just check the lines, tell me what you find. And we've had a gradual increase in the width of the lines. E even the last solstice, we had an, another increase. It's like the intensity. So we had to look around for why. But um, then, then the harmony time stretched to one and a half days and then three days then six days and it's just been creeping up and we extrapolated this to, to realize that by december 2024 we each harmony day would have like 96 days lasting which is like a harmony for all year round and, the, and the, the significance we also found was the shapes of the energies at the nodes changed when you had all harmony and all the frequencies it's like everything came into balance and from having a column of energy with a vortex in it on, on a symmetrical node, that column would collapse into the double torus. And that's that's where the, the double torus on the top of sits on the top of the well, half of it comes above the surface and it has that cauldron look. And the vortex in the middle has that cup look. And the the the, the, the Holy Grail book that I wrote, Grail Found, uh, was linking the fact that we, we thought this could be the invisible grail shape. That the Templars had been looking for, and and and, and the reason for thinking that was the huge number of Templar chapels and, and, and cathedrals that fell on the lines and on the intersections, uh, a, a massive number. They absolutely knew about these uh, cylindrical energies. They built towers on them, um, and so that that stemmed for what did they find in Jerusalem? And um, it, it was it was certain esoteric secrets about. Um, yeah, the, 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 as a phrase, the secret to the universe it, it, it is is um, the key to understanding the secret of the universe is, is 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 understanding how 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 the python is nailed to the cross by by the holy by by the golden nail nailing nailing the python to the cross nailing the serpent to the cross by with a golden nail is a secret to understanding the universe. And you think, okay, right? But the Templars knew something, and and then there was this lovely sort of series of. of synchronicities where people were saying oh you must go here oh you must find that and it just began to open up with the finding really strange esoteric art for instance at a place called monsoon is uh, in just south of toulouse in france the ceiling there has just got art which is if you've, if you've looked at ge the geobiological energy shapes you can see well my goodness they're dead they're showing how energy changes at a node and then, and then when you go along to another place, which hardly anyone's heard of, just in southeast of Spain, because at that stage, I, was, I had a small group of people who were looking for the most powerful lines in the world, these emperor dragons. And we found that one was intercepting in Spain. And in, in 2012, we'd been given this um, message that we had, well, I, I, I was given a message that we have to repair that node. You've got five weeks to do it. Um, and you, need, you can't do it on your own. <laughs> so it's like, oh. Right. <laughs> at that stage i hadn't even told anybody what i was doing i've been i've been researching myself for about eight years and in that five weeks it was just totally bizarre it was just crazy uh, I, I did a talk in bath six people turned up and, and that's when james played the guitar and we got that music sound and we had this magic which is just and all i could think of was how do we get to spain with a group of people and, and repair this um and, and following that I, very soon after that i did a, a talk in glastonbury and I, 67 people had come to it 
And I mentioned that I need people to help with a project in Spain. Three lovely people came up to me afterwards saying, I think I'm an anchor. I don't know why, that, what that means. I think I need to help. And I said, I knew exactly what it means because we need an anchor to do it. Another yeah. person says, I'm an antenna uh, and said, I think, you, I think you're heading to Spain. Uh, but I hadn't <laughs> been told that. And then the third person came up and said, I know people who can fund this for us. Wow. We, were on the, we were on the plane three weeks later. And the week that we were out there, it was just, oh, my goodness. We were token puppets belonging to our civilization as, as we just got guided and pushed and prodded to, to, to do what we had to do. It's just, wow. I still look back fondly at that week. It was just amazed, amazing. And I've since taken groups there. But um, coming back to the, to the, to the, to the, 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 the grail um, shape of energy, that, that uh, just, just near... Near to South East Spain, in, in, in the province of Murcia, there is this um, one of the five holiest Christian sites in, in in the Christian world. And people think, well, what are the five Christian sites? In there? And and of course, you've got Jerusalem, and, and of course, the Vatican, who decides these things, chose Rome as number two. The other three are in Spain. One is uh, uh, Santa Teresa de Libiana. The other one is Santiago de, de, de Compostela, which you might know more at the end of the uh, Camino way. But the third one is a place where miracles happen, where people have pilgrimage, pilgrimages go to, and, and pretty much outside that province of Spain. People don't know about it. And this is a place called Caravaca de la Cruz in, in Murcia. And there, it used to just be a desert with a Glastonbury-like hill on top. And there is this chapel on the top with a fort now around it but in the middle in the old days it was just a desert with a small chapel and the, and the templars had built this tower and you there's four layers to this tower and there's a massive intersection of energy lines there and by the way they didn't find that the really big node they were looking for the really big node but it had been broken which is why they didn't find it but in caravaca there was this uh window which had been boarded up and and i won't bore you with the miracles but this window had, had lettering around this outside it that have never been ever been deciphered on the on what's not told is uh, on the corners of the four walls in this small chapel are these uh, murals with latin underneath it mm -hmm. and you, you can tell that when you when you when you've when you've done the latin translation this is a place that they don't want known <laughs> <laughs> i mean one, one of the images is a serpent on a cross with the words god exalted it in latin underneath now, why would a Christian place exalt the serpent hanging over the cross? Why would you see a font with a dove flying above it with the Latin words underneath it saying sacred bathroom? <laughs> this is this is they knew was a place where there's huge energies, where the soul could be uplifted. They knew it was a healing center. They knew it was where the cross is and they knew about these energy lines. So that was the sort of spurred me on to write about the connection between the grail and um being invisible and, and also with all the powers to manifest and, and we began to look at where did those properties originate from and we traced them back to the legends of the cauldrons um right back to the cauldrons in, in chinese antiquity we're at that point where with 96 days long all year round harmony means that we're going to have a toroidal energy no columns of toroidal energy buzzing all the time probably so, for two or three hundred years so Rory, that's going to give what, it... what are the implications of that then if, that, if if we're going to be in that harmonic state constantly throughout the year how what do you feel that is going to have an impact on us as humanity on the earth well already we've got a highly energized environment getting more and more so it, it, and, and and we think it's driven by cosmic energy um hitting our atmosphere turning into neutrinos and gamma ray radiation and, and and that is in itself cosmic rays are mutational evolutionary so we think it's a kickstarter to our genes to to experience heightened awareness more easily uh, so in other words our range of perceptions suddenly widens and so now we can suddenly see and perceive all the different beings on all the other worlds it's a sort of collective through consciousness as our awareness widens and the veils you know, are lifted, basically. And, and it links to Rudolf Steiner's uh, 
um, cycles of, of, of us moving out of group consciousness into individual consciousness and back into group consciousness. And then this is the work of, I, I, I've been doing with some sacred path modules with groups of people it is the significance of, of working now towards the group consciousness by working in groups because that's the answer now comes from groups as opposed from individuals. And, and the energies were teaching us, the Gnostics would say that the, uh, the the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which is the tree of knowledge, a tree of recognition, the serpent, the Gnostics called the instructor and the teacher, and the serpent is a synonymous for these energy lines, which is why it's had to be made illegal and, and evil and all those sort of things. But, the, but, but when, you, when you start meditating around these these energies, you find that the, if, you, if you surrender to the energies, which is basically the communication to the universal consciousness, are what absolutely starts guiding us towards what we need to know as a group and as an individual within groups. And 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 group learning suddenly became vitally important. And, and, I, and I, I learned this from massive synchronicity hitting me with, with Jung's Red Book and the Red Book images. I mean, you know, even, even in the dream group that I and people were having uh, uh, dreams of kingfishers and I was reading the Red Book about kingfishers, you, you just, you couldn't believe that and meeting people on the banks of the river Froome who were young young analysts it goes on but it 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 led me to just say well what are these images in the in the book about what can we learn from them and everyone's saying oh we don't know what they are we don't know what these things are at the local theosophical society i was running a dowsing group in bristol and i i put it to the audience what can you see what can you feel and hear from these images and, and it was quite shocking how little i'd managed to get myself even after hours of looking at these things you miss so much because you see you perceive reality your way through your strengths where other people have other strengths so if you look at anything you study individually it's two-dimensional compared to when you look at it in a group and see what the group means and then when you, you discover when the group starts working with the subconscious asking for insights to come through from the subconscious and there's, there's techniques that we learn through dowsing them regards just when you teach that to groups you then get insights which start be, to become common uh, in, in a way which is like whoa what are we being told here and now it, it it adds to almost what is relevant from symbolism today from not just Jung's images not that all works of art and inspiration you can start studying in a group and perceive relevant messages and, and interpretations for, for today from the same symbolism that was installed by that same vein of inspiration that the artist had tapped into when they were creating their masterpiece in the first days. So we, we, we can now look back at all the other old prophecies. And I, I coined the phrase the universal prophecy because there's so many different cultures that have this so-called end of times event, which is really a, 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 a phrase for this is, this is the end of the individual consciousness as we move back to group consciousness. What does that mean? And we've got clues everywhere in these old prophecies. And we, we study these as group nows and, and, and in groups and, and invite this whole insight question. And, and, and the biggest, most fascinating one of all is Black Elk's Great Vision, if you know them. Because once you really start getting into that, you realize he's talking about the, the last four ascents uh, going up are four group meditations where we, 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 meditate in each direction and, and there's all sorts of trials and hardships but in, in amongst what he's describing is is how we do group meditation it's like we've been given the message it's in a variety of ways and when we come together the right way when we overcome our differences in a better so we overlook each other's differences in fact there's a very necessary part to a, us being different in fact one of the wonderful things about dowsing is when you teach people to, to find the lines you can teach them to find the center of the line and when you do that when we, well i'll tell you what happened when we first did that i took a group of dowsers to to the sanctuary part of the avery complex and i said let's just look to see where the, the node is here and find find the centers of the michael line find the centers of the mary line and, and see where it is we did that and suddenly all six of us were standing in a perfect small circle about a meter and a half from each other we thought wow we did the same exercise in a, in a node about an hour and a half later down in, in uh, the place called the Long Stones. Hardly anyone goes there, but the two giant stones. Same exercise. And we did, oh, my God, we're, we're not just only standing in the circle. We're in the same positions. I took further groups there. And occasionally I would have a gap and two people trying to be on the same place. 
<laughs> sometimes there'd be two gaps and there'd be two people and, and you'd say we realize actually there are six people it's a bit like your, your, the gene keys that you that you, that you know about there there are there's we each carry something individually as, as six and as 12 and, and maybe in multiple groups and that you in order to have a fully functional group you need the right people in the right place and and you you're you're beginning to to go on this journey of relearning we're being retaught how to come together and do group meditation and we can't do that alone we have to get more and more groups learning and being taught on sacred sites because if you were the creator and you wanted to really give people the right lesson okay you'd want to make sure that we overcome the right obstacles before we get given too much sort of you know ability if you like so and it's this wonderful thing is if we can't overcome our differences we're never going to learn so we've got we're in this lovely situation where we, we need to uh, have many groups meditating on, on and learning in their groups, working together, being taught how to to, to interact with these energies the right way. And, and the beautiful thing is we're, we, we can see it happening that through this insights for sharing the medita meditation. Uh, we, we share the feedback. We get the messages. There's a, there's a lovely one we picked up last year where we start in a circle. And, and if you allow yourself to be moved by the way the energies want to move your body, it's very much like your sinus eurythmy and, and Peter Junos pan eurythmy, where, where you, you're allowing your body to be moved. You, you can find that at the beginning, you, you actually find it sort of moving in a figure of eight, like this, backwards mm -hmm. and forward. And when you look at that, you actually, when you do that movement, you're actually turning to every other one in this, every other person in the circle. Mm -hmm. And with the help of other people we're realizing actually this is a point where we're actually blessing and sending love to everyone else in the circle at the outset it's a it's a perfect start to it so it's like well okay that's how we and then, and it goes on you you well I'm going but there's, there's people who have roles in group meditation there's people who who uh, classic classic cases uh, a few years ago now what, what, two people came up to me independently at Stanton Drew Stone Circle just south of Bristol, second biggest stone circle in the UK. And they said, Rory, I had to change what I was doing. I felt there was too many people bringing energy down from the sun and it wasn't balanced. So I, I felt I had to bring energy up from the inner sun to balance it off. Now, two different people who didn't know that, didn't know them, each other, said that to me afterwards. Well, that's interesting. So one of the roles that some people have is to ensure that the balance of energy is kept right. But not only that, there are times when we want to raise the Taurus higher and bring the Taurus down. Because the Taurus has has this uh, vortex. Um, um, I, I, I'm in danger of sounding like I know what we're doing here. So we don't yet. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> we, 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 we're learning little bits at a time. Uh, and um, that, that's one of the, the key things I have about the, the coming back to, to finding sacred sites and getting the two, that information to people so they can bring uh, their groups to, to that. And that, that's, that's wonderfully happening organically. The, um, the sites and the people that are doing it in Australia, I mean, there's this, I get, I, I wish I could, I wish I could show everybody all the, all the reports I get from people's successes and what happened. It's just, it blows my mind. Um, people going into the desert in the Western Australia and, and, and coming, going to the node, which is up there. And people also, and what, what's happening on the nodes too. I mean, that, that last winter was a very special one on the winter solstice. Several of us had several groups that I'm aware of had similar ex, uh, ex, ex, experiences with starting an incredible turbulence with wind. And uh, the group initially said, well, we want to, see whether we can send some peace out into the world and um and we thought well, we need to connect with the elementals to get help on this and it's a gray sky really windy buffeting us about and it's the same along the, the england as well as at some other areas we all started with quite a lot of turbulence literally after the first two minutes the sun appeared in the sky and i thought oh and then throughout the meditation with gaps where the wind completely died down and it was like we managed to get some sort of resonance within the group and we'd specifically asked to connect to, to the the area mentals uh, for this and uh, what we experienced not just in our group 
but in other groups who are reporting afterwards, at the at the end, uh, we, we do three 15 minute meditations with about five minute gap where we discuss. In the last 15 minute meditation, for the last five minutes, the air had completely died down. There was a peace and stillness within the group. Even the traffic that had been around where, where we were in quite a sort of busy place it, 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 um, had, had seemingly dropped down. There were no clouds in the sky. It was beautifully blue and sun. And it's just like, whoa. And you felt that there was a connection that we'd had over the weather locally. But this is not too different from from it, tribes like the Hopi who who can create rain as and when they need to. But it was like, hang on a minute. This is what other people have experienced as well, up and down in the UK in their groups. And they were reporting that back independently. So we we know we're getting more of an aura of an influence over, over our surroundings. And that that again is a bit of feedback to show us we're we're traveling the right path. We can make a difference. And um that, that bodes well when we have more groups. I think we've probably got about 60, 70 groups around the world, anything from four to, to, to 50, 60 people. So, yeah, that, that, the idea is to try and build that number up. And, and of course, it's beautifully autonomous and independent. So, Rory, one of the questions one of our group asked me to ask you was how to become a facilitator and connect with a module group to start the journey. Initially, there's a, a sacred path module uh, group on the sacred network. Just if you just read, just join the group. It's uh, free to join. The facilitators that are ready to start uh, their modules um, literally are saying, "I'm ready to start there." And and if you get the message, you'll you'll get get emailed, and and you can join the group. It, it it's it's a slow start because I've I've had taken two years to run three groups through it. And those people are now just starting their journey as facilitators. And they've just, so, but the thing is, as soon as you've done level two, you can start your journey as a facilitator. It's going to get a lot easier when the second phase of the next sacred network is developed, because that will be a platform for training providers, facilitators to, to say when they're running an event and people can just sign up at that stage. So bear with us a little bit. The, the, the numbers will be small to begin with, but you'll find by the end of this year, I'm hoping for at least 100, 100 facilitators running courses, which will mean there's 600 people who could who can join courses, and then they'll then be able to run. So after after two or three months, you can do the level ones and run that. So it's it's a self replicating model, where it, it'll take about a, a, a year once once a week, for 40, 90 minutes to two hours a time to run through. Uh, learning all about Jung's road book images, about prophecy, how to become a better prophet, symbolism, how to interpret symbolism and noticing the ambiguity within that, how to work as a group to, to really dig deep into understanding things like Goethe's fairy tale. And there's there's nine or 10, 12 different universal prophecies we look at in real detail from, from cultures, from Japan, Peru, um, um, you, you probably know the, the queer of prophecies here, um, but uh, there's other ones like Black Elk's Great Vision, um, um, the uh, Seven Fires of the Nishinabe is another one we look at, but then there's, uh, yeah, a, a few we look at from Steiner and, and, Dun and Dunoff, um, where we really begin to get to grips with the, how can I say, we, a, a group that's working together effectively. Having done the level five modules and, and they, they then the groups go off autonomously and they explore and, and uh, come back and share. And uh, what, what they're doing now is phenomenal. I mean, I can't keep up with them. If they've like found their legs and they're just like yeah. investigating all sorts of things. And, uh, and there's projects which they've come across, they're following synchronicity and, and uh, recording dreams and meditations. And uh, it's it's magical. And, and that that's that's really what what we want to see, I think. Yeah. yeah. But but it's the power of the group. That's the weird thing. Yeah. It really is. And and the and the uniqueness of the individuality. I mean, there's I remember there's one lovely lady, and she'd start talking about what she'd experienced in a medita in meditation, or uh, 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 about to explain the insights, and we'd all be thinking, where is she going with this? You know, and then suddenly out of the blue, it pops in and hits us. Whoa, how did we get there? You know, it's, it, it's just, it's just, it's, uh, 
Yeah, and of course we're moving into group consciousness, and this is just you know, you know going to get stronger and stronger. Magic. Very exciting times. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm, so I'm I hope wondering... that answers the question. Oh, totally. Uh, yeah. Yes. And I'm wondering actually if we could backtrack a little bit to the sacred network and how you know how it came online and and how it's evolved. I know you've already talked a little bit about you know the group coming together and maybe yeah. pointing out certain areas, but how, how has that all come together? And then how has it come well, together online? Would love to know more about that. Yeah, it's 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 very much to do with exploring synchronicities. Um, and and to, uh, briefly on synchronicity, you have to have two acausally connecting events. The, the trick is you never know when the first event's the first event. Right. It's only when the second event comes along that you think, ah, oh, that connects to the first event. And when after a while, when you explore synchronicities, you, you actually realize I, if I don't explore what might be a first event, I might miss the second event. You then have to add in the fact that you can have synchronicities with a group, within a dream group, a meditation group, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the message comes via the group via, via connecting events in that sense. But I, uh, I had all these these um, sites that I, I, I've had, and, and I, I'm I pretty much finished the UK map with regards to the sites. I nearly finished the Europe with regards to all the main energy lines and the sites. But I haven't quite got to the point where I can write about them and, and, and show everybody what the finished product is, which I'm going to do. And at the end of this year, I, I should be um, able to point out where the maps, the lines are in Europe. And the reason for doing that is not just where the sacred sites are, is because the lines between the sacred sites have got lots of smaller sites yet to be found. And I want people to go and investigate them, find them and, 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 and explore them. And I'm nearly about a third, a third of the way through um, the USA. And I looked a bit of Canada. So I needed to find a way of putting it up there so people could, uh, could visit the sites. Um, and uh, uh, one of the ladies that coming to do my dowsing course uh, said that her husband was a web designer and he might be able to help. He came to the, did the course uh, and, and Paul, that's Paul and Ren. And Paul said, oh, it'd be easy to put a, a, a website together to promote what you've got, make it interactive. Yeah. Um, and at that stage, I just started doing the modules and I was, uh, the, there's a, a chap who, um, I'm never, I was never quite sure what he did actually. <laughs> he's, he's, he joined the groups and he was always very, very keen and, and things like that. But I mentioned I'm looking at trying to put a website together. He said, "Oh, I might be able to help." Um, so he, 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 he was a part um, pro producer or, or uh, someone who actually started with the, something called the Edge blockchain, which is uh, a totally encrypted, decentralized um, web service. For, for, for webs that, that so suddenly from having a web designer and also a server which is completely encrypted in a matter of a week <clears throat> you think well maybe there's something that's that's got to happen here but there's there needs to be some money for this and um be, quite bizarrely I, I was just said well why don't you just ask people and i put together a brochure and we raised we raised a considerable amount of money we, we blew the target out after three weeks um which was really pleasing because suddenly you know i could pay the web designer to do this and uh, and, and get it done <clears throat> and that's how that's how the site and, and it left money left over to cover the second phase which we're doing right now um not not without learning difficulties because when, when everything is completely encrypted so in other words you can have conversations on this on your message boards and activity boards and and if you if you want to make it a private group so nobody else can see but the people in your group, which is what we wanted to really. If you've got a, a group talking about meditation and what they've experienced, you don't necessarily want everything to be shared. Yeah. Well, this is now completely encrypted. You know, not even the CIA are going to see it. That's awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, and, and that might be useful. Might be helpful in the future. <laughs> so that's yeah. that's how it came about. But literally following synchronicity and exploring uh, the, the silliest thing. Well, what do you do? <laughs> what, what's, what's your line of work what's your expertise um and, and 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 synchronicity goes both ways of course this is the other strange thing is that you might know how synchronicity works but you can be pretty sure that most people you meet don't right. so you, you may well find that you're helping someone realize there's synchronicity going on for them right. so you could be that second event and you need to point that out to them
Yeah, so, so Rory, actually our connection with you is for a total synchronistic yeah. situation because we were actually going to hold the island um, to do some ceremonial work. And literally the day before we left, uh, a woman sent to me uh, your sacred network information to say she didn't know we were going to hold the island. And she, and she sent me a message to say that there were these three points in Western Canada um, outside Calgary, Nelson, and Hornby Island. So then we went onto the sacred network site, and sure enough, there was the node on Hornby Island, which we went to the, the next day. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit how you discern uh, something like the node on Hornby Island? Um, yeah, a, a, a few years ago, just before lockdown started, I was asked by a small organization to, to to try and find sites for their members, sacred sites for their members. And they had members all around the world. So I had some time free uh, in the lockdown to to do sacred site searches. So this was a service that I, I used to do quite regularly, but due to time constraints, I, I can't really do it, hardly any of them now. But so sacred site search can take two or three days where you're looking to see, well, where are where's the nearest strong site near to where somebody or some group lives uh, that has to be connected up to the major emperor dragon network and there's only six major type five emperor dragons in the world there were three until 2017 and then three more popped along as i said before everything changed then um so when when, when the, the last emperor dragon came up came actually in it crossed america it sort of entered in um in northern california well just just south of San Francisco, and it crossed all the way, and exited um, around Norfolk on on the um, on, on the uh, east coast. But it goes through some just amazing sites, and and and, and, and some of them uh, intersect with smaller type four lines. And so I was looking for an intersection point where they would take the energy from the Emperor Dragons up into that area of British Columbia to see if anything was anywhere near Hornby Island. I, mean, I didn't know. And the nearest uh, line that I'd found doing that went up just just near Squamish, just north of Squamish, which is, uh, as you'll know, not far away north of Vancouver. But there is a, a Squamish River Trail, uh, uh, which is uh, off, off Tarmac, I think it is. And and the node between another Type 4 line was actually just up along there. And that were noted with a line that, that uh, came down roughly from quite near Whistler across to um, Vancouver Island. And that, that intersected um, uh, Denman Island, uh, went through a couple of interesting places there, but it actually uh, had another node at uh, where was it uh, Mount Henry Spencer. And, and there I found some, some Type 3 lines heading back towards Hornby Island. When you do these cycle so you, you start on the larger scale and, and, and you look at various places which where lines could be likely possibilities and you what, what i do is, is called see, sowing seeds of consciousness so when you're a conscious mind you you think where are the possible places it can be where are the landmarks and i and I, I build that map of where the possibilities are until i completely don't know where it could be i need uncertainty i need to lose myself i need to get to that point where i can't care and then slip into that no mind state and see if I'm going to get any answer that might help me. Uh, and and that the sub subconscious then will move the body, and it'll move the rod, it'll show you where the line actually is in relation to the seeded areas of consciousness that you've set up. So that you've, you know, I, I talk about the French person over in, in the subconscious, at least they've now got a way to, to tell me where I need to look. But I have mm -hmm. to I have to set my symbolism up in advance with, with possible areas. Um, and of course, it's quite tricky when you find one area is like, well, that's obvious that's where the node is, because as soon as you go into the subconscious with that ob obviousness, you're in deep trouble. So you've got to find ways of, of losing that certainty. And, and and it came to down eventually to Hornby Island, uh, and, and there was a bay there, sandy bay, and it looked like some grass. And, and there was the remnants of a node there. When I say that, there's one or two lines that needed to be brought back in. So you, well, that's another story how you move lines even remotely. But if you, if you, if, but, but either way, uh, that was where the node wanted to be, and so uh, um, and it was then fully connected up. And it, uh, the report shows how from the Emperor Dragons, you've got the lines through all the symmetrical nodes to that place. And, and the and the lady that had asked for that was very happy with that. She's she I know she's visited it and she's uh, sent back so. 
I think she probably reg regularly meditates. I don't know if she lives on Hormi Island or, or not. I can't remember that. But I know she's a regular, uh, regularly goes there. And then that was a site that I could put up on, on the network. Um, but but I, I can't show where the lines are on the sites map on the network because that, that, that doesn't give me the facility to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you found it. That And, you know, that this is how people are finding groups now. Um, just recently, there was a, a, people have been going to a place in Southern Ireland, Southwest Ireland, called the Knock Drum uh, Fort uh, Node, and and they are now beginning to form a group that regularly go there. Five, six of them at this stage. Others is um, near, near Madrid. This uh, this lady's uh, asked if there's any near, near Madrid, and I was able to point her to this uh, intersection in, in near Madrid, which was turned out to be an old Benedictine chapel. And now, and, and that, that was a line that ran through Avila, where St. Teresa of Avila used to, to, to levitate and, and, and pray on with John of God, uh, and um, St. John of the Cross, sorry. And um, there's a node there right next to, to, to that ch chapel. And um, she's got groups of people that meditate on those lines. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It, there are groups emerging. There's a, there's a group on a beach in, in the Sunshine Coast in Australia. And they'd have 20 or 30 people now meditating there. And they have uh, wonderful sights of seagulls circling over them when they meditate. We know what you're talking about, Rory, because we actually uh, had a group gathering on the Epiphany, January the 6th. And we went to through about three of our local sites that we believe are powerful centres. And we were together for several hours because we had to drive to three different locations. And there wasn't one moment in the whole time of discord or challenge or difficulty just flowed beautifully with joy and happiness and so we've got a sense already of what we're talking about and we meet monthly with a group again in a, in a spot that we believe is a powerful spot um, so i think we've already sort of started our own journey um, brilliant through synchronicity which will connect in for sure another thing we discovered which you might as well as a uh, we, I took a group to the really powerful First Order node in Spain. We've meditated every Wednesday since for, for, for three over three years now. The very first time we did it remotely when we weren't on, we had the same level of power that we'd experienced when we were physically there. It's yeah. like it takes you up to a level. And then you can reach that level again and again and again. And until you reach to go back, and that takes you up to the next level. Um, but, um, yeah. Yeah, so. and, and you can even feel you can feel it when you're talking about it it really brings that energy forward i can feel that that deep stillness of it was there a particular was there a particular date uh in 2017 when that shift happened because it seems to have been a really important year in many different ways it was kind of july august time um it it, it was about then that the, the lines suddenly started widening and we didn't understand what was going on at the time but we we, we gradually realized that the um, uh, the three emperor dragons had also moved from uh, they were 50 paces wide and they jumped to 100 paces and uh, the, the, the the type four lines which were 30 paces wide jumped around 60 paces wide we're now at the fact that the Type 4 lines not only are 60 paces wide, they're, they're actually now about 130 paces wide, and they have shadow lines. That's it. Yeah. That's another story. But uh, <laughs> uh, but, but the, the first the first Emperor Dragon appeared around about July. Um, no, it, it, it actually didn't appear straight away. It appeared November, December time, and the next one appeared December, uh, uh, January time. And then we had another wait for about six months before the final third Emperor came through. And I think it's it's to do with the active collective nuclei, the, the source energies from the universe weren't able to get through the local interstellar electromagnetic cloud. The electromagnetism shields the Earth from cosmic energies. And, and with our own magnetic field weakening, um, which people don't seem to be wanting to talk about, it seems to be the most <laughs> significant thing there is. There are more more cosmic energies are getting through, and it suddenly is like we we had three suns shining and get onto the Earth, and that was producing enough energy for the three emperor dragons. Now th three more suns have like appeared from out of the sky, sources of of energy, which have now 
come into the core and be tr transduced out back out into these new emperor dragon energies and um it's just making all the difference but but the beauty of it is that it's subtle and it's slow and the the frequencies when i talked about the harmony time first the frequencies were quite high but as these energies have come through the harmony frequency has been overridden by the stronger energy so now all the harmony time energies are exactly the same as the emperor dragon energies so we're, we're, we're moving into emperor dragon dominance if you like with a with a frequency of energy where you almost have to meditate slightly differently there's, there's, there's a and a really strange how you the more you surrender the more the power comes through and it's so much more heart-centered than, than before and, and it's losing yourself in that heart that you begin to think oh goodness and now and then and then there's a surge um and you're right magical things happen amongst the group it's just it's interesting rory that we we actually took a group on the solar eclipse in 2017 up the backbone of vancouver island and uh Focus our attention on the Golden Hind, which is the high, highest point on the island, the Axis Monday. And then, of course, we've got the next solar eclipse coming through in April this year. So, again, it seems to me there's this seven year connection between the two solar eclipses, which seem very significant. The Golden Hind is on, on the, the northwest to southeast line that runs all the way down. I've tracked it down to Texas to a, a rock called the Enchanted Rock, which has got yeah. evidence of uh, 10,000 year old prehistoric settlements there for where people and that's a very powerful magical place if you know that i've heard of it certainly yeah so that's the so, golden hind in the middle of the island that is connected to that yeah so it's on that line that runs that way yeah wow. but I, that wasn't okay, the line that, i found okay. first doing the doing the sacred site search actually yeah. I, I i found that line after I, I i tracked the line from the emperor dragons to 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 the squamish uh, river trail yeah. and then so that that but the thing about finding lines is that you, you can't go off on your own journey right i'm going to i'm going to go and, and check out the lines in bolivia sort of thing it, it, it's a sort of journey which is you it's pointless finding sacred sites if no one's going to be connected to them so you, you are actually wasting your time no one can go there so, yeah. so there's a journey which has a, has a life of its own where where suddenly in people will emerge or something's going to happen and or, or a line that's got your interest and you think oh that's something and then you get a, a phone call or an email saying oh, i live such and such here do you know anywhere near me here and i'm thinking i'm oh, just when you just worked on this so there's this, there's again a form of synergy that that brings the right people together for the right place and, uh, yeah. and, and it's, it, yeah the magic is growing slowly the energy is growing slowly so the, the the one thing we can take away from this in this crazy world is that we don't have to be we're not being rushed yeah this transition to group consciousness if it happened fast it would just blow our minds in fact the unfortunate thing is there are some children today and some people today who are being affected and they're already having the veils taken away they're seeing feeling and hearing things which they don't understand and they can't talk about because everyone thinks they're mad but when those are the people we need to help because this is they're the tip of the iceberg yeah. and there always will be you know but we, we hear of the children of light uh and, and well, the indigo children people call them the, these are the youngsters of today and, and in many ways what we're doing is preparing the world for them um, yes. that's the that's the importance of this work and, and um and and the children of light will be luminous the, the, the light will come back like like the old christian religion was known in the east it was the luminous religion the religion of light um so um it's interesting, uh, Rory, it's 11-11 it's as you're saying that here. Sorry? <laughs> it's 11-11 here as you're saying that. <laughs> oh, well. So I think we made a very important Good point. Timing. So well. I, we're coming to the end of this amazing conversation, Rory. Thank you so, so much. And just want to ask you um, to share your website information, Sacred Network, where people can find you. Thank you. Just RoryDuff.com. Um, there's, there's an events page there. I'm nothing up there at the moment because I'm, I'm too busy, but there will be dowsing courses there and seminars I'll be doing. But the Sacred Network is sacrednetwork.org, which is just go on there, sign up, and uh, you'll be able to get to the sites map. You can join groups, start a group, um, and um, post comments on the sites. Uh, and the second phase is going to be hopefully starting in the next 
within the next two months where where you'll be able to uh, to, to find it easier to to interact and, and connect with the other people and, and to form groups but that those are the two ways um okay yeah great thank you oh, do and buy also, me books they're on the site as well <laughs> that always yes, helps. get this one for sure it's a good good place to start there's one which is quite fun if you like if you like a novel which is the grail hunter Grail hunter. The grail, okay. grail hunter is a nice, easy word. It's, it follows a woman, a young woman who's who's trying to find her way in life, and she gets directed down to the Cathars and to, into Spain, and, and finds all these uh, things, and finds how synchronicity can can help her life. And that that that's a nice, easy way too. We love to ask people at the end of our conversations, you know, how how we're we're taking the shambles and transmuting it into the shambhala, and and asking you. Um, you know what? What is your highest dream for the world right now? What What is your greatest dream for all of us? Okay, uh, I'll start with the reason, if that's okay, because we yeah. we are purposely being divided. There, there is this Hegelian dialectic to to divide us is to is to how they conquer us. We can't fall into that. The, the the whole concept of duality has been thwarted by people saying it's about opposites. I don't believe there's anything to do with opposites. There's two two different aspects of the same thing. And Jung himself was mercilessly crucified by his uh, the, the people on, on the other side helping him. Uh, he calls the numinous because he, he needed that theory of opposites until he eventually gave in and said, I can see what you mean, but I find it boring. But so duality is not about opposites, about two aspects of the same thing. And if we fall into this trap of of trying to to fight a side or even go down that route we're not going to come together so we have to kind of like accept that that's going on but it's wrong and go our own direction and and the direction that i'd want to see is 10,000 groups all around the world regularly meditating on several thousand sacred sites just coming together connecting with the the energies and, and doing it on a on on days when we're all doing it at the same time, that power of doing that, just connecting, is, is enough. That the, the power is in the light side on all the higher levels, and and if they know we're doing that and we're joining in, in fact, <laughs> the messages we keep getting is with 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 the ones everyone's waiting for to do this. It's yeah. like we're the last to catch up, um, but that that. We uh, just doing that will make the difference because even even in the small groups, and you notice the the power and the effectiveness of that happening just now with small groups. Imagine now, ten thousand groups around the world, and and I, I set out in in the in the brochure of the sacred network site is our aim, is for the site to not be needed. Yeah. So you you found your groups, you're working automatically autonomously within each other. That's great. You're, you're with that sacred site and you and you're there and and, and that bubble of light can rise and, and shine so uh it's it's there to start to kick things off so that that's that's my dream and and, and i think you know if we can do that in 10 years it's quite possible five years we can get maybe a, a thousand groups i think and then and then move up to ten thousand by the year uh, 2030 maybe but but it, it's at, at the pace it's supposed to be that's the beauty of it we must not get in the way. Getting in the way is where we we, we have a problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful dream. And we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll hold it with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Laurie, thank you so much for the wonderful work that you have already done and are obviously going to continue to do. And I feel this synchronicity coming together anyway between us um, and, and turn the way this is working. Beautiful. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to, to speak to your audience. And thank you, too, for all you're, you're doing. And uh, um, I always feel it's all a bit one sided, these conversations, because <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a whole element of, of uh, things I, I know you were talking about earlier that we could we could uh, interact and share with share with and uh, discuss further. But uh, maybe next time. Next time for sure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK.